Hill's uh, study on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, today we're doing part three on the historicity of the Shroud of Turin, um, and this is going to be our final episode addressing some of the issues um, that relate to the Shroud's historical provenance and its uh, or- date of origin. Now, last time, in part two, we we ended off by presenting three of the more substantial or persuasive evidences that um, argue to me that the Shroud of Turin probably, very probably, goes back to 6th century AD Edessa. And what we're going to do this time is, well, okay, that's great, but what if it's a 6th century fake? That's certainly possible. Uh, How do you get it to link the Shroud of Turin to the historical Jesus or or to the first century AD? Is there Are there any historical evidences that would allow us to do something like that? And in the first place, I, I think that there are. And to save time, I'm, I'm going to opt to bypass the, spec, the speculative histories about, you know, where the Shroud of Turin was before its rediscovery in Edessa, you know, in 525 to 540 AD during the rebuilding of the Edessan walls. Um, and instead, uh, I know there are at least a couple plausible options as to you know how the shroud ended up from the first century and, and ended up at that point in Edessa. But instead of getting into that, I'm just going to leave that. But in the recommended sources section, uh, for anyone interested, I'll provide a source uh, that goes over everything from the first century all the way up to the present day. So you can look that up. Um, so in the second podcast, instead, what I want to do is get straight to it. I want to focus directly on what I think some of these main indicators are, historical indicators, uh, both on the pro-Shroud side and on the Shroud skeptic side alike, to see if we can establish uh, does the Shroud date from the first century? Is it consistent with a first century date? Are there any evidences or indicators that would suggest it does? It can't date from the first century or be linked to the historical Jesus in some way. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on. And I just wanted to to make a, a quick mention that in parts one and two of my Shroud podcast, I I was quite uh, deliberately in certain parts trying to be very emphatic uh, or assertive, and um, you know I made some provocative statements because what I wanted to do, like for example, with the you know the biases of the radiocarbon scientists, or you know saying that the sudarium of Oviedo is proven beyond reasonable doubt, um, and really I, I did this because I want to try to motivate people, you know, both Christians and shroud skeptics alike, to to really you know feel challenged to look into the details of this, you know, see if, don't just take my word for it, believe, you know, check to see if what I'm saying is true, see if there are uh, counters that I'm neglecting to mention or forgetting to mention in this and, you know, come, come to your own decision. So that, that was really why I uh, was adopting uh, that sort of standard. But in, in part three and going forward, I think I'm just going to not worry about that. It, it's up to you. If you want to check out the sources, uh, that's your your affair. Um, my job is just to pre- present the data to the best of my ability and present even the, sh- the shroud skeptical side, again, in the fairest light that I possibly can. So, so you understand what the evidence is on both sides, and then you can make your own decision. So that's what I'm going to be trying to do in this uh, podcast going forward. So yeah, uh, apart from that, let's get straight into it. So uh, what is uh, a first historical indicator here? And when I'm saying indicator, so I'm using this as opposed to historical anchor points because I think the evidence uh, showing that the Shroud of Turin dates to the 6th century is somewhat stronger than uh, the, the evidences or arguments that are put forward to link it back to the first century or to Jesus. Um, although I, I would say in our conclusions that I, I do think I am persuaded that the evidence shows that the shroud belongs to Jesus. And really one of the main arguments that is the first one, and this is what convinces a lot of people uh, and many shroud reacher, researchers that the shroud is authentic uh, in the sense that it belonged to the historical Jesus himself. And it, it relates to um, a topic that I've been, I don't want to get into too much in this section on historicity, but there, there are various wounds um, that we're going to be discussing in a later podcast, but they seem to be unique to the passion account of Jesus in the Gospels. It, you know, things like the crown of thorns or the 
the spear wound in the side. Um, that that's the sort of the type of thing that they have uh, in mind here. And like I said, um, this is this is what links it to Jesus in the minds of many shroud researchers, including non Christians. Um, my own, I'm actually personal friends for the last couple of years with uh, a shroud expert, and he was the official stirb photographer back in 1978, uh, Barry Schwartz. He's Jewish. He he doesn't believe the shroud of Turin is is evidence, you know, of a supernatural uh, or a mer- image or a miraculous, um, you know, event attesting to the truth of Christianity. But he does think that the shroud evidence shows that it belonged to the historical Jesus. He thinks it's authentic in that sense. Um, now, just one point here. This actually will be getting into this works. This argument works in conjunction with the. Uh, arguments that eliminate certain image forming mechanisms and again that's that's not part of the I want to separate that from the discussion on the historicity aspect I've, I've done a lot to try to avoid discussing features of the images or or explanations so I, you know I've, I've tried not to assume it's not an artistic uh, piece of you know an artwork or a painting or something like that but in order for this argument to work you just recognize that there is some overlap here and it, it works in conjunction with the fact that we know it's not an artistically created image, um, and really the normal, in terms of natural mechanisms that involve just a human body and the laws of nature, um, as we'll find out, there's really only one that I think is an equal possibility that could work. But the circumstances that are involved with that um, seem to make it unlikely that it would be anyone other than Jesus. Um, you would have to say, you know, we, well, we won't get into explanations, but let's just say that there are circumstances which make it unlikely that, you know, there is some other person who is deliberately meant to look like Jesus, plus some unlikely natural phenomena was taking place in conjunction with this artist's attempt, and it, it, it all just happened to coincidentally work. But again, I, I don't want to get... Uh, down that rabbit hole, but one thing I can mention here is that from the from these wounds, there there isn't a historical indicator that we probably can ar- try and argue that these wounds employ various Roman weapons or t- uh, crucifixion techniques uh, that were specific to the to the ancient Roman military guards or the executioners, and these techniques were specifically banned in and around the year 315 AD with Constantine, uh, the first Christian Roman emperor who, you know, outlawed the use of, the, of these uh, weapons and, and cru- specific crucifixion techniques. Now, that's not to say that crucifixions didn't happen in later centuries. They, they did. Um, they, weren't as, they weren't frequent, but it's the specific way that the Romans crucified people um, that the shroud is the shroud man's wounds appear to be consistent with suggesting or indicating that the shroud should be dated at least to the fourth century or, or earlier. And I just wanted to, in this light, I, I wanted to quote from an expert. He's a forensic professor of pathology and forensic pathology in, in Los Angeles. Uh, his name is Dr. Robert Buckland. He was a, a stirp scientist who investigated the shroud. Um, he's got over 50 years of experience whereby he personally conducted over 25,000 autopsies uh, in his capacity as a forensic expert forensic pathologist. And just to read a quote, he, he did a, he wrote an article entitled The Autopsy of the Shroud the Man in the Shroud. And his conclusion with regard after looking at the very identifying the various wounds, um, he said this. So, at this point, having garnered much information about the injuries of the body from a purely objective point of view, as a knowledgeable and expertly trained forensic pathologist, it is the ultimate responsibility of the medical examiner to confirm, by whatever means are available to him, the identity of the deceased, uh, as well as to determine the manner of 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 his death. In the case of the man in the shroud, the forensic pathologist will have information relative to the circumstances of death by crucifixion, which he can support by his anatomical findings. He will be aware that the individual whose image is depicted on this cloth has undergone 
various puncture injuries in his wrists and feet, uh, to his head, uh, multiple traumatic whip-like injuries to his back, and a post-mortem puncture in injury in his chest area, which has released both blood and a watery-type fluid. From this data, it is not un an unreasonable conclusion for the forensic pathologist to determine that the only one person historically who has undergone this sequence of events must be the man to whom the shroud belonged. That person is Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah, that's his expert opinion. That's, that's definitely something to consider there. Now, now, just before we get too ahead of ourselves, um, I think it's important to point out that there are uh, some interesting uh, historical arguments that Shroud skeptics try to bring up that try to rule out Jesus or a Jewish person uh, having any connection with the Shroud, or, and or they, they also argue that a first century date for the Shroud of Turin should be ruled out on uh, various factors related to the portrayal of the Shroud Man. So I just want to give uh, some some of these. So, you know, for example, some Shroud skeptics will claim, well, the Shroud Man has long hair. Th this is more of a medieval conception of Jesus rather than, uh, rather than one that's accurate to a first century Jew living in Palestine. Um, there's also a related objection, which is more theological one. We'll save that for later on. But, you know, they try to argue, well, having long hair is forbidden in the Bible. You know, the Apostle Paul, for example. Um, they also try to argue again with the hair that it, it looks unnatural looking. It's, it's right by the sides. It kind of looks like a waterfall coming out from the sides of his head. And also the man in the shroud is much too tall. He's taller than the average first century Jew in Palestine. And then also there, they have a bunch of objections related to Jewish burial preparations, um, you know, as disclosed through the Shroud Man, seem to be inconsistent with first century Jewish practice. Um, and just so you know, as I said, there, there are some other related objections, which if I miss them here, uh, because they've been eliminated for the sake of time, just so you know, they will be addressed as counterfacts later on in at some future point in their study. But I just wanted to focus on some of the main ones related to the uh, historical inaccuracies as, you know, a sort of a counter feature that Shroud skeptics would bring up. So, okay, what can we say in response to the Shroud skeptics' uh, arguments here? Well, um, in the first place, with regard to the long hair, um, as I said, skeptics want to claim that this is a contradiction with how Jews in Palestine during the first century looked. And they also point to something we've mentioned before, that the earliest depictions of Jesus portray him in the Greco-Roman style, you know, having short hair, uh, clean shaven, that sort of thing. But unfortunately, this sort of claim is just, it, it's not true. Var various uh, experts and ethnologists who have studied the Shroud Man in the first place concur uh, without doubt, that the Shroud Man clearly depicts a man of Middle Eastern origin as opposed to some later medieval origin or conception. Uh, just to give you one such expert, so you don't think I'm uh, making stuff up, there, uh, there's a former Harvard professor who was a world-renowned ethnologist. His name is Carlton S. Coons. And he's clearly stated that after analyzing numerous photos of the Shroud Man, in his expert opinion, he concludes that he, the Shroud Man was a very definitive physical type found in modern times of shepherdic Jews uh, in the Middle East. Okay, well, that's great. That links, uh, that shows he's a modern day Jewish person, but what about the conception related to the first century? Um, well, other historians have commented on this, stating that the man's hair and beard are precisely in accordance with first century Jewish customs. In their own words, uh, they say, um, so these are, you know, Dr. Gressman, Bolst, and Daniel Rops. Uh, they say, hair worn long, parted in the middle, and having what looks like a long, unbounded pigtail in the back is absolutely typical for Jewish men of ancient times. So it seems like the historians and, and the experts seem, seem to disagree with this common skeptical objection. Um, you know, that Jesus must have had short hair. I, I think this claim is really primarily based on later evidence uh, 
of depictions of Jesus in the Greco-Roman style or context, which historically, you know, have no provable relationship with how the historical Jesus actually would have looked like. What about the fact with the hair? What about the fact that it's unnatural looking? You know, it, it kind of has a waterfall effect, as uh, Gary Habermas has described it at times. Um, but this is really easily explained through the use of a chin band or a chin strap. This is one of the, the cloths mentioned in John chapter 11, verse 44, for example. Um, so in Greek, that's uh, in Greek, it's sudarium. And biblical scholar John A.T. Robinson has this to say. So the only position that fits the biblical descriptions of this cloth is that of a chin band tied crossways over the head, round the face, uh, and underneath the chin. So, you know, this is what explains the waterfall effect on the shroud man. His hair was tied to the sides of his head through the use of this chin band, which is in perfect accordance with first century Jewish burial custom. Now, here's here's a one interesting, here's another interesting objection, because it's actually true, to some extent, I would say. But, uh, so, shroud skeptics will claim Jesus is too tall uh, for the average Jew, as depicted on the shroud. So, just so you know, in terms of uh, what we're able to get from the shroud. The shroud man is estimated to be about 5 feet 10 inches, and that is somewhat taller than the average height of a, of a Mediterranean Jewish person living around the time of Jesus. It's, it's not too, too much over, but in the first place, one response would be, okay, so, so what? Pe- some people are taller than others. I think this is necessarily a, a problem that proves it can't be the historical Jesus. However, um, in point of fact, we don't even need to go there because after scientists have determined that after factoring in the effects of the cloth's potential drape during image formation, if, if you're assuming that it was during the resurrection and there was this cloth collapse or radiation forming mechanism that took place, in addition with the fact that the shroud's been rolled up and stretched out for centuries on a spool, you know, the shroud man's actual height is probably closer to about five foot nine inches or thereabouts. And we have various uh, archaeological finds of skeletal bones dating from the first century BC through to the fourth century AD, uh, which were discovered in the in Galilee. And they actually reveal that the average height was this um, five foot nine inches, which was coincided uh, coincidentally with the Jewish Talmud's interpretation of the ideal male height, which was said to be four L's. So that's approximately five foot 9.29 inches or 176 centimeters. That's in perfect accordance with the shroud man as we as we have. So this objection actually, doesn't work either. There's there's nothing to discredit Jesus as being a po- the possible candidate uh, for being the Shroud Man based on the, his height. Now, uh, what about the last one? And I, I mentioned there are several different angles or arguments within this category. But this this try the Shroud skeptic here tries to argue that the Jewish burial preparations were inaccurate. They didn't. They weren't in accordance with first century Jewish burial practices. So in the first place, uh, many skeptics like to claim, well, it, with Roman crucifixion victims, um, in the first place, part of the punishment was they're left on the cross or they're thrown into a pit, a common pit to be eaten by scavengers. This, this was part of the punishment for being crucified. So they try to, you know, argue, well, Jesus, this couldn't be historical. Jesus couldn't have been buried in an empty tomb, therefore he couldn't have been wrapped in a shroud that caused these images. However, you know, this is just historically, it's not the case. We know for a historically proven fact with certainty that the Romans made exceptions for Jewish people. For example, if the family asked uh, to take the body to have it buried, um, we have archaeological proof of this. In 1968, we found uh, Johannan. He, this is one among, we have other findings as well, but he was found with the crucifixion nail still embedded with the wood from the cross through his ankle. So he was buried. So it, it's, it's just not true um, that Romans never made exceptions and that therefore Jesus couldn't would have had to be buried in a pit as opposed to a tomb. Furthermore, with the the archaeological evidence, it, it's interesting because the shroud man is naked, and in the position where he is, he's he's on his back with his elbows uh, protruding, 
uh, slightly at the sides with the hands crossed over the wrists, crossed uh, at the point of the wrists over the pelvic region. This is precisely the exact same position that we, we found many skeletal remains at the site, ancient site of Qumran, which is where the Jewish sect known as the Essenes, you know, the, the guys that made the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, came from. And, and we, we found their bodies and skeletal remains dating from 200 BC all the way up to 70 AD, which support the Jewish position that the Shroud Man seems to be uh, seems to be in. Yeah, I think these first two objections just aren't, again, they aren't the case. However, here's one that's true. Stirp, Stirp discovered, discovered in 1978 that there's actually no myrrh or alloys on the interior of the shroud. Well, this seems to be at odds then. This can't be Jesus because the Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 39 mentions an extremely large quantity, about 100 pounds worth uh, of these substances. So I guess this can't be Jesus then. Uh, this must be, you know, they made a mistake and forgot to put that in. However, by, by way of countering this, it first in the first place, it doesn't seem to make sense uh, of saying that, you know, there was a, these substances were in the form of some kind of liquid. You know, you wouldn't use pounds to describe a quantity of liquid. It's it's more probably that this is referring to these substances in a powdered or, you know, a dry block form in a bag, something that would have probably been bes placed beside the body to postpone putrefaction. Uh, this is especially given the fact that, you know, it was, it was hectic for them. They were trying, rushing to try to uh, bury, put the body uh, in the tomb before sundown on the Sabbath day in accordance with Jewish law. You know, so th this would make... This would make more sense as to what this verse is talking about. So it, it could also be that they were using plants or leaves and, and place them on the outside of the shroud on top of it for the same reason. Um, you know, th this could also make sense. You know, why why were the women coming back on the Sunday morning? Well, may maybe they realized they did sort of an incomplete burial prep and they were coming to finish and do it properly the, the next after the Sabbath. Just in terms of these various objections, I, I think it's, it's interesting that we know historically that Romans made various exceptions for Jewish people. And again, that was only during a specific period in history. Th this is a date indication as well, because this really only took place from about 6 AD through to the first Jewish revolt in 66 AD, um, where Romans would allow families to take bodies off the cross and give them a proper burial in, uh, in Judea. Um, after that, you know, they, they weren't, that wasn't really allowed. The Romans took full control. So, yeah, given that the Shroud Man indicates he was crucified by the Romans and that the Romans were only known to have made these exceptions, you know, this would seem to, this could be used to indicate that the Shroud dates from in the first century, sometime between 680, um, when Augustus removed the, the first king, Herod's son Archelaus, and installed the first Roman procurator, um, and 66 AD with that first Jewish revolt where the uh, Sanhedrin court was officially abolished. And also with the last point, as I said, uh, Sturb only ever investigated the inside of the shroud, not the outside of the cloth, uh, at least not with the backing removed. So, you know, if they had, who knows? Maybe they would have found the presence of myrrh and alloys, just like the Gospels describe. So I don't think that any of these factors can be said to conclusively rule out uh, a first century Jewish burial, uh, or Jesus specifically. Now here, here's uh, another, here's the final uh, Jewish burial prep objection that Shroud skeptics raise, and I, I think this one is the most substantial um, one that we have. So basically what it is, is Shroud skeptics will claim that the body of the Shroud man has not been fully washed. I mean, this was evident because there's various pre- and post-mortem bloodstains present on the Shroud man. You know, obviously this is inconsistent with first century Jewish burial practice, and Guess what? The Shroud Skeptic is absolutely spot on in this case. However, uh, there are actually two different schools of thought on, on how to answer this. So the fir in the first case, um, it's not actually clear that Jewish tradition does say that the body has to be fully washed. There are some Talmudic uh, traditions, uh, uh, Mishnah traditions, that actually 
argue that it was illegal to wash the corpse of a violently killed man if there was a sufficient amount of blood. And I think it's about a quarter, a quart or so. I can look up the amount. Uh, but uh, there's a specific amount that they give over which if a man was violently killed, it was illegal to wash uh, the body. And there are some traditions, as I said, within early Judaism that suggest this. The other approach is, is the one I more lean towards, and this, is, uh, this was offered by two Shroud skeptics, uh, Daniel Spicer and E.T. Totten. Uh, we're going to be discussing them later on in another podcast because they have um, an image-forming mechanism, a naturalistic image-forming mechanism that we need to talk about. But he's advanced the hypothesis he, that, well, the body could have been partially washed. We know that they were in haste to bury the corpse before sundown on the Sabbath. They were in a rush to take him off the cross. So here's what, uh, in his own words, here's what Dan Spicer and, and Totten say about this. So an examination of the Shroud literature suggests that there are two schools of thought. Um, we take the second uh, school. However, we, we know that the body must have been washed somewhat because there would have been profuse bleeding uh, that would have caused them to look like a, you know, caked on blood or, or a blurry image on the shroud, like a big, like a, when you put a Band-Aid over a blood stain, it becomes a blob. So they think there can, that if the body was only superficially washed, this would account for why there's still some blood stains there, pre- and post-mortem blood stains, but also show that they were trying to act in accordance with Jewish tradition, and possibly this could explain why they were coming back on the Sunday to finish the job that they weren't able to complete before sundown on that um, the day of the crucifixion. Just wanted to say in closing that I think there there aren't any clear indicators which can be shown to argue that it uh, first century date is inconsistent based on indicators within the Shroud Man himself. But apart from that, I, I actually think that there are a couple indicators, w- subtle that they may be, that suggest the Shroud can be date back, dated back certainly earlier than the 6th century AD and even back to the 1st century uh, as well as to the historical figure Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so I think that uh, should do it for uh, his historicity arguments, pro and con, based on the appearance of the Shroud Man himself. Uh, you know, does he date from the first century? Was he Jewish or, or was he even Jesus? There's also uh, three different physical tests that uh, Shroud researcher Giulio Fonti has, has presented. These are scientific physical tests um, based on the flax fibers and, and how they change with age. And these indicate something interesting. So, first of all, in terms of what these tests are, the first one is using a Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, or FTIR for short. And when uh, Fanti used this te- uh, this technology, <coughs> sorry, this technology, he discovered that the shroud uh, gave him a date of 300 BC plus or minus 400 years. Uh, The second test he used was uh, using Raymond spectroscopy, and this yielded a date of 200 BC, plus or minus 500 years. Uh, The final test is a relatively new one. This was done in 2015, and it's an alternative analytic method for estimating the age of uh, historic linen fabrics based on their tensile strength of of the flax fibers themselves. And this gave him a date of 372 AD, plus or minus 400 years. So all of these dates place it back earlier than the 6th century and are consistent with a 1st century AD date. So it's interesting to note that the stated uncertainty values of all three of these combined are two sigma values. You'll remember that that was sort of a statistical standard that the radiocarbon dating tests failed to fall with it. They were more than two, two sigma values over. So with the two sigma values, this is equivalent to a 95% prob- probability range. Jeez. Uh, probability range or degree of certainty. And what we get is the th- average of the three tests is that the shroud dates to about 33 BC 
plus or minus 250 years. So yeah, I think combined, these these physical scientific tests seem to be suggestive or you know, indi- indications that the shroud dates back certainly earlier than the sixth century, and uh, are perfectly consistent with a first century AD date. Just one point, uh, though, to be fair to the shroud skeptic, with the with the last test, with the tensile strength of the flax, it has to be admitted this is a relatively a relatively new test. This is a relatively new test. I'll finish this off. Um, and it, it uses, uh, you know, new tables that are derived from testing a series of controlled linen cloths uh, with known ages dating from modern times all the way back to ancient times. But, you know, there are various questionable elements here, or areas of concern, because it's, it's difficult to know the environmental conditions in which the historical cloth has been kept. Uh, as well as the sensitivity of the chemical and structural characteristics of the cloth uh, in response to these unknown environmental conditions. So the, the last of these is, is less of a, is less, it's more recent and more tentative, I would say, compared to the others. And also with the others, bear in mind, they do have that, you know, that wide plus or minus, you know, range, 400, 500 years. And, and that. Uh, so those are some problems the Shroud Skeptic would give, but uh, like I said, o- overall, I don't think it's an issue because when combining these, the, the uncertainty values are fall within the statistical, international statistical standards of being uh, two sigma values, which equals a 95% degree of certainty that the Shroud dates within this range. We also have another scientific test, and this one is a chemical or microscopic uh, comparison test that was done by Sturp chemist Ray Rogers. And what he found after analyzing uh, some shroud fibers through his microscope, he found that the damage to the shroud fibers indicate that the shroud is quite, quote unquote, quite old, similar to flax fibers from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and as we know, those are dated anywhere from 250 BC to 70 AD. So in his his opinion, this indicates or suggests that the Shroud of Turin should also date to about the same period of time. Just bear in mind, uh, again, that you know microscopic comparisons can sometimes be problematic. It, it does involve subjective judgments, as we'll see with some of the conclusions Walter McCrony made based on using his microscope. So I I would say that further confirmation is needed here, but it's certainly indicative that the shroud could be within this general date range, as opposed to a 6th century or or certainly the medieval period, for example. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our next major category, and this is related to the cloth itself. This is, these are related to the textile evidences. Uh, so what is, what is that? Textile evidences are, are basically, they're factors about the linen cloth itself, you know, the threads, the fibers. On that level, we have several factors which could be said to be uh, relevant to the dating of the shroud. In the first place, um, shroud skeptics have, have a few arguments to raise here, and the first one is that it must be mentioned that the, the shroud appears to be in quote-unquote excellent condition. What they mean by this is that it, it's it's unexpectedly, it's, it's unique in the fact that it's very pliable and flexible, uh, at least underneath, underneath the first uh, couple layers or the superficial layer where the image is. All other such fabrics that have been discovered, ones dating centuries prior to it, uh, all the way up until the medieval period itself, don't compare with the shroud's quality preservation. It's better than all of the rest. Even other ones that are said to be in good condition don't compare with the Shroud of Turin for whatever reason. So, you know, some pro-shroud experts think that this is, well, oh, this is evidence for a supernatural neutron flux mechanism because if that was true, that would have actually strengthened the uh, flexibility of the shroud fibers themselves. And when that's combined with the fact that the shroud has been kept in some favorable external conditions, you know, little exposure to air or light, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, this is one way that pro-shroud enthusiasts who think, yeah, this is a supernatural image created by the resurrection of Jesus, the way they explain this excellent condition or unique condition of the shroud is through a neutron flux hypothesis. Coincidentally, uh, Nick Sack brought up an objection I hadn't uh, really 
uh, thought about before or whatever, but the issue of mold or mildew growing. And um, by the same token, if this neutron flux hypothesis is true, then that would make the fibers resistant to mildew or mold formation as well. So I uh, got two for, two for the price of one on that one. However, uh, what's one that's more related to dating? And here's a second shroud skeptic uh, objection. And this is a common one that you'll see uh, online all the time. Basically, the shroud cloth is, a, is woven in a three-to-one herringbone uh, pattern or twill. And it, it's spun with a what's called a Z twist. So this is really a fancy weave. You know, they, they try to say, well, this is such a complex weave pattern, and it, it's you know, particular stitching is very distinctive. It's very rare. This could not possibly have been produced in the first century A.D. or prior to that. It, it has to date to the medieval period. Now, I just have to say, in the first place, in terms of the, the shroud being comparable to medieval linen fabrics. Actually, this is not the case. There's nothing comparable to the shroud that has ever been found that originated in medieval Europe, at least. And secondly, I, I just have to say that before moving on with that first part, and I've quoted an expert. I'm going to provide his article in a source for you guys, but John Tyre, he's an, a textile research, researcher in Manchester, England, and he studied the shroud through X-radiographs uh, he stated this in regards to the shroud being more comparable to medieval fabrics on a textile level. In the first place, the shroud is a very poor product by comparison to medieval European fabrics. It is full of warp and weft weaving defects. The impression I am left with, in my expert opinion, is that the cloth is a much cruder and very probably earlier fabric than the backing and patches. This, I think, quite conclusively lifts the shroud out of the Middle Ages more than anything I, else I've seen about the textile. Furthermore, Rob, Rob Rucker has a quote here as well. One, one thing that we know is that um, some historians claim that the spinning wheel was invented in Asia sometime in the 11th century AD, and it only really spread to Europe by the 13th century, so in the 1200s AD. Since the shroud is is obviously it's made of hand-spun thread, therefore it, it, this is an indicator that the threads that compose the shroud were probably spun prior to the 12th century. Um, now I know that that doesn't necessarily get us back beyond the 6th century, which is the topic of this, but that's just a, another indicator. It's that it's not medieval that you could use as well, but. Um, in the first place, we have to say that the Shroud Skeptic is just plain historically wrong here. There are dozens of examples of cloths with just as complicated and or more complicated weaving patterns dating back thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene, during the time of Jesus, and after the time of Jesus as well. You know, I, like I said, there's I literally have a list of, of about a dozen examples. Here's three of them. So we have fabrics with a four-to-one twill dating from the year 1450 BC in Egypt. Uh, we have a two-to-two twill. Uh, these are leggings, which date from about 800 to 500 BC. We also have linen cloths with a three-to-one twill or weave just like the shrouds that uh, comes from the ancient city of Palmyra dating to 136 to 200 AD. It's just not the case that such a complicated complex weave pattern didn't exist in Jesus time. We we know with historical certainty that it did. Now that that said to be fair to the shroud skeptic, these patterns weren't common. They they you know poor people couldn't afford these types of cloths. Uh, but remember, Jesus was taken in by the rich Joseph of Arimathea. He, he went in his tomb. So it's fully plausible that he would have bought a, a rich linen cloth and buried Jesus in it. There's nothing inconsistent with linking the shroud cloth based on its complicated weave to Jesus of the gospel. So I just, I've got a couple quotes here from textile experts who, in their expert opinions, say that they're nothing about the weaving pattern that can rule out a first century date. So the first one comes from an Italian syndonologist uh, named Emanuela Marinella. And he says, this weave pattern that we see on the shroud originated in Mesopotamia or Syria and was well known in the Middle East or Palestine at the time of Jesus. 
Without a doubt, the herringbone weave pattern that is found on the Shroud of Turin could have been produced in the Middle East in the first century AD. Uh, I've also got a quote from our, our good old friend, Meth Child Fleury Lemberg. I, I quote a lot from her because uh, she has she has the most firsthand experience with the Shroud. You know, as I said, she was in charge of the 2002 restoration project, so she got firsthand time a lot of first-hand time to study the cloth directly. So that that's why her opinion is very important, and I keep quoting her. But she says, after her own extensive analysis of, of the entire shroud cloth, that the linen cloth of the shroud does not display any weaving or sewing techniques which would speak against its origin as a high-quality product of the textile workers of the first century AD. So yeah, I think, I think the shroud skeptic is just misinformed on this front. It, it, there's nothing that would rule out a first century AD date uh, based on the weaving pattern of the shroud. Now there's there's also a third objection that some uh, shroud skeptics raise based on the textile consideration. And this one is, is uh, basically that the Gospels state that Jesus was tied with linen strips in the plural. So this, this doesn't include the Sudarium of Oviedo, which we're calling the headpiece or the headcloth. Um, so there must have been two or more cloths, um, plural. Well, the shroud is just one cloth, right? So this couldn't. Uh, this is a historical problem. The shroud can't be linked to Jesus. Now, um, again, shroud, shroud expert Barry Schwartz, again, he's Jewish, not a Christian, counters this kind of objection best, I think, when he, when he humorously says, uh, now, I, I guess most of these shroud skeptics don't realize that by the first century, even the Egyptians had stopped wrapping their mummies in strips. You know, he's, he's being a bit uh, facetious, a uh, bit uh, humorous there. But, you know, there there is a point to be had here by the Shroud Skeptic. It, it was an enigma to many biblical scholars as to, okay, what is the what is the gospel trying to go on about here? What, what are these multiple cloths, plural, of which the body was wrapped? John Jackson has solved the, this mystery. And what he's done, he, he's discovered... Uh, that there is a long strip of cloth which seems to have been torn off from the Shroud of Turin, obviously used to, you know, bind the body, um, the Shroud to the to the body of Jesus, as we would say. As well, there is also that chin band, so that would be another cloth. But in terms of this strip, it was subsequently re-sewn back onto the Shroud. And uh, again, uh, Fleury Lemberg found that the stitching pattern of this seam is similar to the stitching found in the hem of a cloth, which was discovered in the Jewish fortress uh, of Masada. So that's where the uh, Jewish zealots were destroyed um, by the Romans after the first Jewish revolt. This uh, stitching pattern has been convincingly dated to anywhere between 40 BC and 73 AD. So yeah, there's nothing to rule out a first century date. We, we have an, a plausible explanation as to what the gospel is talking about. And the explanation itself is supported as being plausible through archaeological evidence uh, of similar seams being found. Now, going on to textile studies onto the pro shroud side, we also know from the textile that there are many factors that are con- that are proven consistent with Jewish custom and um, get, provide a positive indication that they date from the first century. So, in the first place, we all know about the Jewish kosher laws. You know. It, the shroud, interestingly enough, uh, is can, is made of linen, but there there is also remember the raised sample that I mentioned in part one of this series, um, and there was cotton found in that, uh, and that cotton was obviously contaminated the shroud during the manufacturing process itself, so it's not a later contamination. Um, now this is perfectly fine. There's nothing against uh, in Leviticus or Deuteronomy against mixing cotton and linen. What, what is forbidden is mixing linen and wool, and there is no wool found on the shroud at all. Obviously, being consistent with Jewish standards, it must have been manufactured in a way that was sensitive to these Jewish proclivities or um, prohibitions against mixing wool and linen. Also, transmission photos reveal the presence of various patches uh, throughout the shroud indicating an older provenance. This is very vague. We, we can't do too much with it uh, apart from saying, well, we have the medieval patch, but um, we also have so many other patches 
that okay well this suggests it, it probably goes back dating to the to ancient times maybe um, but more work needs to be done on that front I, I wouldn't say that's conclusive in any sense so what another indication is that these shrouds size it, it's woven to specifications once when certain factors are taken out um, through stretching and that sort of thing the original specifications that scientists have determined the shroud would have been would have been approximately eight cubits long by two cubits wide. And this is using the ancient Assyrian cubit standard, which was widely used in the area of Palestine during the first century AD. So again, that matches up. Also, uh, another thing just to say is that ra raking or grazing light photographs uh, of the shroud actually can show the various fold marks of the linen cloth. Um, because lin linen has a sort of memory that can reveal how the cloth has been, you know, historically folded over the, the centuries. And um, John Jackson and his team have developed a computer program to analytically map uh, all of the prominent folds that are found on the shroud. And, you know, he, he's found that these folds are consistent with the design of a lifting device that could have been used for raising the cloth in Constantinople. Uh, that was part of the quote of Robert de Clary. Again, that, that doesn't prove, that's sort of um, more related to part two, but I just wanted to bring that up as well since I didn't bring bring it up in part two there. However, with, with these folding patterns, the reason I bring it up here is that there are also a couple of water stains which are present on the shroud, which when placed in the proper alignment, they indicate a folding pattern that allows us to fit the shroud very snugly into a container of ancient design, uh, one that was not really prevalent in later times, you know, in the later Dark Ages or medieval period. This is another indication, hey, this is suggesting the shroud dates back to ancient. So if, I think, um, yeah, that that's uh, sort of a summary of the evidence from the textile, at a textile level that indicate an older provenance of the shroud. However, uh, we also have various uh, dirt studies, and I alluded to this uh, with mention of the Sudarium of Oviedo. However, there, there's also been uh, several studies of the dirt particles from the shroud, which you know have established chemically that they're quite similar to soil and stone, which was typical of the area around Jerusalem and the site of the Holy Sepulchre or the Protestant Garden Tomb sites. Some shroud uh, experts say that this dirt evidence is really compelling. It's very consistent with showing that the dirt on the shroud has the same chemical signatures as does the dirt found on the Sidarium Oviedo as the Calvary site in Jerusalem. So that, that's an intriguing, intriguing indication or link to the historical Jesus there. However, I, I want to be fair to the shroud skeptic here because this evidence has been uh, questioned a bit. It, well, not questioned, but this evidence has been classed by certain pro shroud proponents as being what's called class two. So in terms of the evidences, I, I neglected to mention this. Most of our, our evidences we've been discussing are class one. So some shroud researchers classify the evidence into class one, two, and three. Uh, others, you know, claim it's a type A or type B fact or type C. Really, the distinction, I'll just try to find the distinction here. So what what is the difference between these uh, various facts? Well, in the first place, a class one fact. It, basically, this is a rating given to evidence that is firmly supported by the scientific and or forensic research. Uh, basically saying it's beyond questioning. Um, and that type A, you know, unquestionable observation. So that, that's really a, a lot of what we've been presenting so far. But there's also type B or class two, and these are confirmed observations or conclusions based on a proof which have been made in uh, scientific literature and are supported by the scientific and or forensic research. Uh, but this item of evidence still requires some additional confirming research. Uh, and then there's finally class three, which is, you know, some some shroud experts have documented or reported this evidence, but it, it remains disputed or controversial and, and can't really be relied upon. So in terms of this dirt evidence, this falls under the category of class two. And again, we'll, we'll address that when we go over in part four, when we start discussing the various features of the shroud image uh, and, you know, how we rank various features that we use. But in terms of this dirt evidence, this would be classified as a class two 
uh, or type B type evidence. But it so in that sense, it, it's it is significant. It is scientifically documented and backed up. But just understand that there are some further confirmations that needs to be done before we're too dogmatic in using it. Um, likewise, I also alluded to the various pollens and flowers that have been discovered on the shroud. And basically, shroud some pro-shroud proponents allude to the fact that the shroud's pollen fingerprint, and uh, as well as some of the images of various flowers which are on the shroud, are consistent with the shroud being in the ver- in the general vicinity of Jerusalem uh, during its pre-European history. Also, we can actually narrow that down to the season, March or April, just like when Jesus was crucified, as to when these pollens got onto the shroud. So just so you know how, how this, this is a, a study called palynology, and there are roughly about 380,000 species of plants that have so far been identified on the planet Earth. And, um, you know, there's been various scientific studies of the pollen, starting with Max Frey in the 1970s and 80s, who, who sort of did a detailed study using uh, from the shroud itself, and he identified various pollens, uh, about 28 of which, which could only come from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the only place on Earth where all 28 of these flowers are are found um and again like i said uh, that suggests an easter time frame as to when these pollens got on the shroud in addition i've also mentioned and there, there's been subsequent studies on, on the pollens as well but uh, not as detailed as, as max phrase now that said it, i mentioned the last time the sudarium of oviedo and and in 2014 a group of scientists opened up a new paleon paleontological research on the cloths uh, on both of these cloths, the sudarium and the shroud. And a notable discovery was made. However, related to the dates, um, getting into the dates, and this is why I bring up the pollens, is there is an interesting pollen, pollen sample that was found adhered under a stain of blood. So that this shows that this pollen must have been there while the blood was still fresh. So it's, it's indicative of when the shroud image is uh, were formed and therefore its date of origin. And what's interesting is that this pollen type is associated with um, various embal- ancient embalming practices. Um, so I'm just trying to find the quote. Here it is. So, so the entomophilus types of pollen always appear wrapped by oily substances, which not allow, which do not allow its identification. However, the Hylasurium, this is the one found in the bloodstain, was used to produce bombs for the funeral rituals mixed with frankincense and myrrh. Therefore, these kinds of pollens were associated with resins, gum, and oil used in ancient rituals, according to Pliny the Elder. They were employed um, for that purpose. Well, that's what we would expect with Jesus, right? Now, the interesting thing is that these botanical products were largely abandoned during the 3rd century AD for funeral practices. So this could be an indication that the shroud dates to the 3rd century AD or earlier if this new finding as of 2014 can be further substantiated or further confirmed. So that's an interesting line of evidence to look into. Now, uh, just to be fair, again, to the shroud skeptic, I, I think it's critical to note that really the evidence from the pollens, again, is classified by some pro-shroud proponents as a class two evidence. It's, it's not so much that the evidence isn't good, it's that Max, because of Max Frey's untimely death, Frey never really published his results, and, and therefore there was a, a lack of peer review, scientific peer review on his finding. You know, also it wasn't clear whether Frey used S what's called SEM based analysis to support his reported findings. And because of that, I think you should be iffy on being too dogmatic on using the pollen evidence to prove the date of origin or, or geographic location of the shroud, at least until further confirmation has been done. Uh, on this pollen data, but it's it's definitely a good start, and I'm going to include some sources on on both the pollen and the the dirt data for you to to check out. So yeah, I think coming to our final evidence, and this one is very exciting in the fact that it's very specific, if true. Um, and this is the fact that some shroud researchers, such as Alan Wanger, have detected what's a, a coin 
over the place of the eyes. If you remember, I mentioned in previous shroud studies that it, it almost looks to the naked eye as though the shroud man's eyes are open and very owlish. And what some shroud researchers now think is that, well, this is because in first century Jewish practice, you would put coins over the eyes to keep the eyelids shut. And um, th this has been conclusively proven to be the case by archaeologists. It, it was at one time doubted whether this was an ancient Jewish practice, burial practice uh, at the time of Jesus, but it, it has been archaeologically proven, both before, during, and after, including we found these coins in uh, Caiaphas. You'll remember him from the gospel. He's, he's one of the, he's the high priest uh, during the time of Jesus. And he and his family had these coins. So what's interesting is um, when they found, using various image enhancement techniques, um, it, it's known as a log E interpretation system. Uh, so what that, putting that over the shroud man's eyes, they've ident identified what they think is a coin over the right eye at least, and re more recent data has got one over the left eye as well. But it, it looks to be a coin that was issued by Pontius Pilate it can be narrowed down to a very specific period of time between 29 AD and 32 AD. That's exactly the time when Jesus was crucified. My goodness, uh, this is great evidence. Uh, if we can, if we can establish it. So, just to give you an idea of how, what the findings include. So, in terms of this coin, um, the coin itself has a clipped corner between the 1:30 and 3:30 um, clock position point. Uh, that was found on the shroud man here. It also has a crook or a sort of a staff image on it um, that that was found on the shroud man. Most tellingly is the fact that there are certain letters U C A I that have been found on the shroud. And these are also present on these coins. And that, this is where we get the date between 29 and 32 AD. Um, basically, they come from letters representing the name of Tiberius Caesar. But what's, and they were, you know, issued during Jesus' time on earth. But the interesting thing here is that these letters are a spelling mistake. That's not the way in Latin. You don't spell U-C-A-I. It would be UKAI. Um, so th because of this, this is intriguing. The shroud has this same spelling mistake, just like these coins. So it, it seems to be the fact that, you know, this could be used as evidence, suggesting the shroud dates from between 29 and 32 AD. Now, obviously, with that, um, you know, coins aren't limited to that one specific time. Of course, they would have been in circulation for a period of time afterwards, but it, it certainly gets us a limited time, and we wouldn't expect these specific coins to be going around for centuries and, and that sort of thing. So, it, it again, not conclusive, but it, it could be used to narrow down a time prior to the 6th century, certainly, I would say. No, here's the problem with this evidence. That this is actually, you'll remember the classification system I gave you. This is uh, the worst of all the classes. This is a class three uh, evidence. So it, it's been documented and reported. I'll, I'll provide some sources from Alan Wanger and or from others to, you know, give give you an idea of well, how are they getting this? As well, I'm going to provide some skeptical articles about this based on pattern recognition because I. I personally am skeptical of this evidence. I don't use it. Um, same with Barry Schwartz. My, whoever, uh, Gary Habermas, he's all for this. He, he thinks that this is good evidence that you can use. So, yeah, take a look at it and decide for yourself. I myself don't use it. I'm sort of skeptical of it. And and other pro shot proponents, you know, put it as a class three thing. So, you know, it could be true maybe with some further evidence confirmation or some development in the enhanced image processing techniques that are used to confirm the presence of this coin, then maybe someday it'll be strong enough that I'll be confident in, in using this as a as a date. Because as I said, if true, I mean, wow, this, this would be great evidence. It would narrow it down. That it would almost be undeniable that this is Jesus, in my opinion. So uh, just to conclude then, what, uh, you know, coming to an end of our uh, historicity question on the shroud, I think there are some conclusions that we, we've learned here. So in the first instance, I, I think that I've argued successfully that the dating issue itself 
is ultimately irrelevant as to whether the Shroud of Turin and its images constitute miraculous evidence for Christianity. I, I don't see it as relevant. Number two, I think I've argued that the 1988 carbon-14 dating results are, are unreliable and, and should not be used as solid evidence that the, the Shroud definitely dates to the medieval period, especially through you know providing various explanations or plausible ways to explain how the Shroud could be of first century origin and still provide those medieval results, some of which, with the neutron flux, don't, don't even assume the carbon-14 dates were wrong. They assume, no, you got it right, but here's why they were off. The neutron flux enhanced contamination is what, what messed it up. Thirdly, I think it's very, very probable. I'm not going to overstate the case and say beyond reasonable doubt or anything like that, but it, it's extremely probable. I'm probably somewhere... 80, 80 to 90 percent range leaning on the latter end that the shroud dates at the latest to the sixth century AD. Remember, based on the Sudarium, the art and coin compare odd feature comparison argument, and the Hungarian Prey Codex manuscript. And finally, number four, I, I think that I would say there are no valid or persuasive reasons which would make it more probable than not that we should rule out a first century date of origin or rule out that the shroud was linked to the historical Jesus. By the same token, I, I think there are some subtle indication indicators which uh, historically suggest that it does date to prior to the sixth century, even back to the first century, and possibly that it belonged to the historical Jesus himself. Okay, so yeah, that, that will finish off our discussion on the Shroud's historicity. Um, going forward, uh, you know, these podcasts, just so you know, on the Shroud, will be posted on a less frequent basis. I was doing this for David's uh, podcast, Extravaganza Week, and I, I really wanted to get the Shroud's historicity uh, out all at once for people to understand all of the evidence in, in one, you know, in a short period of time, because that, that's not really the main focus of my own book or my own chapter on the Shroud. I'm, I'm more interested in what we're going to be talking about next time, starting in part four, uh, which is evaluating the images and how they were formed and, and what conclusions can be drawn based on the image formation of the, the Shroud's body and images and its blood body and bloodstain images. So, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to be doing uh, next time, um, is in our establishing our case that the Shroud's images and their formation constitute what I call a G-belief authenticating event, or, you know, in layman's terms, a, a miracle that which attests to the truth of Christianity. And first on the list will be criterion A. So that's going to be establishing, well, what's the proof? What exactly are these various features that and properties of the Shroud's images that I'm talking about? You know, what, what has been discovered by Stirp in 1978 and subsequent to that, uh, which could possibly be used to argue that these images are miraculous. So yeah, t tune into that. I think that'll be a good show. And thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.